today as we come to the table. God opened up a door and God gave an opportunity and now he's standing there and he realizes I've got to address something and when I say this, I'm not only possibly putting my life in danger, I could be hurting our relationship if he doesn't kill me. This is definitely gonna wound his pride and yet it says that the wounds of a friend are faithful. And so we come to those times where we may have to wound even a friend by telling the truth. Look, I love you, but I've got to tell you this. And I know you're not going to like what you're going to hear. But we have to make our mind in advance. Are we willing to lose that friendship in order to do what's right? Since Daniel had already decided he was going to stand for God regardless, when the spotlights turned on him, he was ready. Have you made a firm decision to follow Jesus no matter the cost? The Holy Scriptures explain that disciples of Jesus are to pick up their crosses daily and to follow Him. This can be difficult when the cross comes with mocking, peer pressure, or other temptations of the world to conform and blend in. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. As you listen to today's message from Pastor Mark, he teaches you about the importance of deciding before the hard things come your way. Make a firm resolution in your heart today that no matter what cost is involved in the future, you will follow after Jesus. You will know in your heart that true life is indeed in Him. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Daniel chapter 4 with today's edition of Come to the Table. Imagine the weight on Daniel at this moment. All of a sudden, it shifts from the spotlight being on Nebuchadnezzar telling about his dream to all the spotlights on the stage turn and they turn to Daniel. And there he stands. And the king says, now, Daniel, tell me what it means. You talk about a heart rate. I know what this means. And I know that this man can be very wicked when he doesn't like what he hears. This could be my life. I could get in extreme trouble. But the difference in Daniel and these other guys is Daniel was a man of developed character. And he realized he needed to speak for the name of the Lord in this opportunity as a testimony and as a witness, regardless of the consequences and the outcome. And I believe there's going to be more opportunities for many of us in this room over the next year or two to do that very thing. But if we don't let God develop our character right now, then we're not going to stand the test when the time comes. This is the moment of developing character. This is when you go to God and say, God, change me, make me into a man that is able to make a stand like that or a woman that is able to say the truth when I'm in front of those who need to hear the truth. Why? Because it's not just so we can make a stand and say, boy, wasn't I bold? I I told the truth. No, so that mankind might be saved, that that person I'm standing in front of might hear the truth and be saved and that those around can hear. And that comes by character and by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit as we prepare in advance. Because if you wait until the moment that spotlight hits you, you're probably going to fail, and so will I. And again, what I love about Daniel as well is not just that Daniel was a man who was ready. He was a man who knew the decision that he had to make. He knew the stand that he had to make. He was prepared for this, but he also realized, you know what, it's, it's better that I get the consequences, as we said, that I don't tell it because I want to reach them. Guys, this is something we need to understand. There's going to come times in our life when we need to confront people that we love. And I say confront may not even be the best word. We need to address someone that we love with the truth, and it's going to be painful. And note this, it may cost a friendship. It may cost a family relationship. And here's the question we have to ask ourselves. When God opens the door and gives me the opportunity, as long as I do it in love and I know that it's God, Am I willing to put their future salvation ahead of what is going to happen to me? I think the reason a lot of us don't share is we're worried they won't like me anymore. It'll cause a family division. They're going to get mad at me. It comes back to us. And we've got to come to a place to where we say, you know what? No, they are more important. They're the ones that I need to be looking to. It's interesting. Proverbs in the same chapter says two things. It says, open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. Again, in other words, 
We think we're being loving by hiding it. We're like, I don't want to say anything because I know it'll cause a problem. And the Bible says, no, that's doing damage. The open rebuke is much better. I know you may not like the outcome, but it's better long term. It's better eternally. And then the other one, which even is more convicting to me, the wounds of a friend are faithful. The word wounds there stands out to me every time I read that. What he's saying is there may be times you have to deliver a message from God to someone that you love. And Daniel loved Nebuchadnezzar. No doubt he'd been praying for Nebuchadnezzar for many, many years to be saved. And now God opened up a door and God gave an opportunity. And now he's standing there and he realizes, I've got to address something. And when I say this, I'm not only possibly putting my life in danger. I could be hurting our relationship if he doesn't kill me. This is definitely going to wound his pride. And yet it says that the wounds of a friend are faithful. And so we come to those times where we may have to wound even a friend by telling the truth. Look, I love you, but I've got to tell you this. And I know you're not going to like what you're going to hear. But we have to make our mind in advance, are we willing to lose that friendship in order to do what's right? Since Daniel had already decided he was going to stand for God regardless, when the spotlights turned on him, he was ready. Are you more concerned about what people think about you? Am I more concerned? Are we more concerned about society accepting us? Look, it's a lot easier not taking heat for what you say. I get it. But God's going to be calling us, I believe, as I said, even more and more to situations where he's going to expect us to step up to the plate, and Daniel now needs to do it. Daniel makes up his mind, I'm going to do this. Here it is, God, you've opened this door, and here we go. And so he tells him, I've had this dream, the holy God is in you, tell me what it is. And then Daniel, verse 19, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time. Now, how long was that? I don't know. I mean, it it wasn't just astonished. No, he noticed the Holy Spirit adds, for a time. How long did he stand there? And look what it says, and his thoughts troubled him. No doubt his whole countenance changed. And I can imagine him kind of looking away from the king and this kind of troubled, you know, just like, oh my goodness. Okay, this could mean life or death for me. The king's not going to like this. I know what this means. I have to tell the truth. God has put me in this place. God, I need you to encourage me. I need your power. I need your strength. I imagine all the prayers that are being thrown up at that moment by Daniel. I know I would have been doing it. And notice this, Nebuchadnezzar, it's such a a radical change on Daniel's face. He recognizes it. And so the king, I think this shows that the king had a heart for Daniel because he doesn't get mad. Notice what he says. So the king spoke and said to Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Translation, it's okay, Daniel. Tell me what you need to say. I can see that whatever this is is not really making you very happy, but I need to hear it. This dream is troubling me. I need to know what's going on. Tell me. So I love Nebuchadnezzar's heart. Although he doesn't repent at this point, although he doesn't fully receive it at this point, his heart is at least tender enough to say, all right, Go ahead. And you know what I found most of the time when God puts me in situations where I need to address a situation, God has already gone before me and prepared the heart. And when I think somebody's going to be really upset, oftentimes they're not. Now, sometimes people are, but oftentimes God already has the heart ready where it might be something they know they don't want to hear, but they realize, I needed to hear this. This is from God. And I've seen God do that over and over. I think this is where Nebuchadnezzar's heart was, quite obviously from the way he responded. And so I think this gave great courage to Daniel. And was the answer prayer, no doubt, probably God now saying, Daniel, it's okay. I've put you here. I'm giving you courage. Say what needs to be said. And Belteshazzar answered and said, my Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you and its interpretation concern your enemies. Look at the tenderness and love that he had for Nebuchadnezzar. Why would he love Nebuchadnezzar, right? There's nothing really love worthy about Nebuchadnezzar up to this point. He's, he's really, you know, if anything, you know, again, we're not to hate anyone. But there's nothing love-worthy about him, that's for sure. Why did Daniel have such a tender heart for Nebuchadnezzar? Remember, the Bible says Daniel prayed three times a day to the God of heaven. And no doubt over all these years, and many years have now gone by, he's gone to the throne room and said, God, have mercy on Nebuchadnezzar. Have mercy on Nebuchadnezzar. Have mercy on Nebuchadnezzar. And I'll tell you a little secret if you haven't already figured it out. Those that you struggle with and maybe that you don't even like, if you pray for them, your heart begins to change. It doesn't mean you want to hang out with them. It doesn't mean they're your best buddy now. What it means is God begins to work in your heart to take away the anger and the bitterness and the hatred, and God begins to give you a heart that that you start looking at them as an eternal soul that needs God rather than, ooh, they did that to me. And so Daniel now has been praying and praying, and now this is his opportunity. He's like, wow, now I've got a chance to share my faith more clearly with Nebuchadnezzar, and oh my goodness, I've got to be the bearer of bad news. But the bad news is going to lead to good news. It's going to lead to brokenness and salvation. 
And so he says, may it be your enemies and not you. It shows his heart and his love. Now he gives the interpretation. He says, the tree that you saw which grew and became strong, whose height reached the heavens and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the heaven had their home, it is you, O king, who have grown and become strong, for your greatness has your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens and your dominion to the end of the earth. So, so far, so good. And then so much as the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and, and bronze. And by the way, iron and bronze are medals of judgment in scripture. So it's showing that Nebuchadnezzar is going to be cut down, but he's, he's being, it's the judgment of God upon him in this. He says, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, that is him, and let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. So this is going to go on, whatever this is, is going to go on for seven years. Again, again not, not something you want to hear. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King they shall drive you from men. In other words, you're not going to be living like a normal man. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. Again, notice he's going to have the dew of heaven on him. That means he's going to be living outside with the animals like an animal. He's going to basically go insane for a while. He's going to lose his mental capacities. You talk about uh, problems here, you know, mental illness. This is a major mental illness that he's going into right here that's going to be happening to him. And by the way, there is a mental illness that goes with this even today. It's very rare, but it's called lycanthropy. And it's where a person begins to think they're an animal and they live like an animal. And in many ways, Nebuchadnezzar was living like an animal. And God was saying, if you're going to live like an animal, I'm going to let you see what it's like for a while to live like a real animal, to get your attention and to get you to a place of repentance so I can show you what it's like to live like a child of the kingdom. And sometimes that's what it takes. Maybe God is saying to some of you right now in this room, look, you've been living like an animal. I'm going to allow you to do that until you come to your senses. And I'll allow the consequences to come in until you're broken and repent. And this is exactly what he's doing to Nebuchadnezzar. He's saying, this is what's going to happen. By the way, I want to note this. We're going to see later that he does get healed of this mental illness. And that's encouraging to me because God does heal even mental illness. He doesn't just heal physical illness. God heals mental illness. And, you know, we have mental illness in our generation right now rampant. I think a lot of it has to do with the last two or three years of what's happened with all the lockdowns and all that. People just couldn't take it. But we're seeing in our young people in this generation a lot of mental struggles that are real. And I didn't see those in the kids. You know, when I was growing up my age, you didn't see that. You saw that maybe in those that were older. Now you're seeing it in the kids. And so the hope that we have is, yes, by the power of God, they can be set free. They can be healed, but they need to hear that God loves them. They need to hear of the power of God and be led to God so that God can heal them and God can set them free. Notice he goes on, he says, They shall wet you with the dew of heaven. That is, they'll be living outside literally. And seven times shall pass over you. That is seven years. And notice this, until, that's the good news, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. In other words, once you're chopped down from your pride, and you realize that God is the one on the throne and that God gave you your power and authority and that he's the one you're to look to. When you know that, when that humility and that brokenness takes place in your heart, then you'll be healed. And again, I wonder again, how many of us, maybe even someone here this morning where God is saying, I'm going to allow this calamity in your life until you look up. You know, the amazing thing to me, and we're going to see, indeed, he says here, it's going to be seven years. It took seven years for him to look up. What does it take for us? You know, I look back on my life, and how long did it take for God to get my attention? It took a long time before I would look up. And for some of you this morning, God may have been allowing right now you to be dragged through the mud time and time again, wondering how long do I have to do this until you finally come to your senses, acknowledge your sin, repent to God, and look up. I will heal you. My desire is to heal you. My desire is to restore you. My desire is to give you eternal life. But until you do that, I can't do it. And so again, I see, you know, again, is this stubbornness on Nebuchadnezzar's part? It might be. Is it simply the consequences that God delegated to Nebuchadnezzar? It might be. But either way, I think, man, seven years, come on, Nebuchadnezzar, you could have responded faster than that. 
But look at this. I love what Daniel does because he doesn't finish with bad news. He turns some encouragement here. He says in verse 26, And insomuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you. In other words, you're going to be restored at some point after you come to know that heaven rules. How encouraging is this? Now, now the first part's not encouraging at all. You know, you're going to be chopped down, become like an animal, eat grass, and it's going to happen for seven years. You're going to lose your mind. That's what your future is, Nebuchadnezzar, because you refuse to repent. But here's the good news. The stump's going to remain, the roots are going to remain, and fresh growth can take place once you come to your senses. And guys, there's a principle here. Two things I want to say. Number one, when you're counseling someone, and maybe God puts that hard message in your heart to give them, you need to be able to end with good news. Look, I know I had to tell you some hard things, but God loves you. And there's hope for you. And if you repent, this is going to happen. So be encouraged and don't put it off. Turn to God. And so, again, very, very encouraging here of giving that message, you know. But but the other thing I want you to grasp that's encouraging to me about this is that maybe you feel chopped down today and you have repented, but you still feel chopped down. God's going to restore you. The stump was left and the stump began to grow fresh growth. And we're going to see that God not only restored Nebuchadnezzar, he even gave him more than he had to begin with. Notice what he says. He says, verse 27, Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Now look at his advice. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. His message in essence was this. Repent, turn from what you know is wrong, and God will heal you. God will restore you. And maybe this doesn't even have to happen. Listen, the same message is for every one of us in here this morning. If God right now is warning you in your heart, you say, look, I know that the road I'm on is bad. I know the way I'm living is not what God would have. I recognize now, maybe for the first time, these calamities, maybe it is God bringing this in on me to get my attention. Respond to that. Repent. Don't be like Nebuchadnezzar at this point and say, nope, not going to do it. I'm not ready. I'll put that off to later, whatever. Listen, the consequences will come if you don't. The good news is this, if you choose to repent right now, today, before you walk out these back doors, those consequences can be totally wiped away. You don't have to go through what you can't even see you're about to go through if you keep going down this road. And I can tell you as a pastor in counseling over all these years, the majority of the people that are in my office that have a problem are not there saying, please help me prevent this from happening. They're usually on the other end of it saying, you're not going to believe what I let happen and here's the mess that I'm now in. And again, I wonder how many times did God speak to them prior to that and say, repent, repent. Repent. God may be speaking to some of you this morning. If he is, you need to respond to that. Sadly, Nebuchadnezzar does not respond. And look what happens. Look at verse 28. It says, All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. By the way, note this. At the end of 12 months, look how much longer God gave him to repent. I mean, you think God just warned him. God said this is going to happen. God is so gracious. And when God gives a warning, God does give time to repent. But the question is, when did the first warnings begin? Some of you may be at the end of those warnings of God. This may be the moment where God is saying, you better do it now or there's going to be greater consequences. And so you need to respond to that. But I love the graciousness of God because God here gave him time. Even though he didn't repent right away, God gave him time. And the king spoke saying, it's not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. Again, look, he still got his eyes on himself. It's all about Nebuchadnezzar at this point. And while the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he wishes. In other words, the judgment that was pronounced is now going to take place until you humble yourself and repent. But as soon as you do, see, that's the good news. As soon as you do, restoration. That very hour, The word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and he ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Not good. 
And now we see what happened at the end of this. Now that's his testimony, but look, he says, look what God did for me. Verse 34, at the end of this time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. That is after these seven long, miserable, hard years, I finally broke. I finally repented. I finally looked to heaven and my understanding returned to me and I blessed the most high and praised and honored him who lives forever. Again, look at this natural praise coming out when someone is truly repentant. He says, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? And at that time, so he's finally where God wants him to be. At that time, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom and excellent majesty was added. So not only did God restore me, he added more. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways are justice and those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Wow, what a way to end that chapter. Notice what he says, God is able to break any man's pride. Listen, as we finish today, I want to encourage you on a number of things. Number one, that person that you think will never be saved, God is able to bring them down. God is able to break them. God is able to save them. Don't stop praying. Don't give up. Keep on lifting them to the Lord and say, God, break them. Whatever you have to do, that's a hard prayer to pray. But God, whatever you have to do to get their attention, get their attention to bring them to you. Secondly, for some of us in as believers, starting out the new year, listen, God may be saying to us, you know you're going down a path you shouldn't be going down. You know you're getting involved in things. Yes, you're saved. Yes, you know me, but you're throwing away reward. And secondly, you're bringing consequences into your life and the life of your family. Repent. And if God is saying that to you right now, don't be like Nebuchadnezzar and think, well, I've got 12 months. God gave him 12. No, maybe not. You know, the word may come down this evening. God may have already been speaking. You know, God is gracious. He does what he needs to do in every person's life. But at the same time, the Bible says, you know, that we need to respond immediately to the Spirit of God. And so I encourage all of us, if God is convicting us of something, respond to it. Don't leave this place without confessing it and saying, God, I turn it over to you. And next, we need to make sure and say, God, you know what? Let me be ready when my trial comes. This is the time to build character. You know, we don't know when that Daniel moment's going to happen when we're standing before the king or whoever it might be, and we have to speak the truth in love, and we're going to pass or fail depending on the character that we have at that moment. And that character needs to be developed right now as we say, God, develop my character. Make me into the man or woman you want me to be so that I can stand when I need to stand. And lastly, again, for those who don't know the Lord, if you're here and God's opened your eyes for the first time today or you're watching online or you're listening by radio and God's saying, look, I've been talking to you the whole time. You may be hiding in your car or watching behind a TV screen, which I'm not saying people hide when they do that. Oftentimes I, I realize that's wonderful. But you may think, hey, I'm in a safe place. And God's saying, no, my spirit is reaching you right now where you are and saying to you, I'm giving you a warning. I'm the one that's brought these troubles into your life because I'm trying to get you to break and look to heaven. And if you don't, it's only gonna get worse. I'm going to turn up the heat. I can do this longer than you can because I love you and I want you to break. How long are you going to live like a wild beast among the wild beasts of the world? Repent, turn to me, and I will restore you and I will save you and give you eternal life. You've just heard another broadcast of Come to the Table. Whether today is your first time joining us or not, we're delighted you did. We want to give all of our listeners the opportunity to learn more about Jesus and Come to the Table is the vehicle to do just that. So we just want to say thank you for taking the time to listen to this teaching of Daniel by Pastor Mark. Maybe you've heard the story about Daniel and the lion's den or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These stories, like so many others, are found in this Old Testament book. It's also chock full of God's faithfulness. Did you know Pastor Mark teaches on much more than just the book of Daniel? For other messages, just go to our website, thewaymedia.net, and click on Come to the Table tab at the top of the page. From there, you should see links for our podcast available on Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or Stitch. 
While you're there, feel free to shoot us any questions or comments you have about Jesus or this radio ministry. We'd like nothing more than to talk with you. For a more personal contact, we welcome a call from you. Our number is 865-609-1385. That number again is 865-609-1385. Do you live in the Knoxville, Tennessee area? Do you have a church you call home? You're welcome to join one of our services. We have several services each weekend and also a midweek service every Wednesday night. We'd love to meet you as we gather for a time of fellowship. We'll be back with you soon on Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary, Knoxville.